O Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. Please. <clears throat> So a young rabbinical student asked his teacher, Rabbi, why don't people see God today as they did in the olden days? The wise old man put his hands on the student's shoulders and he said, the answer, my son, is because no one is willing to stoop so low. For the second time in as many weeks, we hear Jesus telling his disciples that their expectations are backwards. Last week, Jesus explained for the first time that being the Messiah meant that he would be handed over and killed. And Jesus tells his disciples that they too will have to pick up their crosses and follow him. Simon Peter's dreams of being Jesus' vice messiah, you know, the right-hand man of the future king of Israel, and the son of God are turned upside down. And in this week's gospel reading, we wonder if the disciples have learned anything at all. It's not as if Jesus wasn't being straightforward. I mean, Jesus was leading his followers through their home region of Galilee with the purpose of making that final trip to Jerusalem. It was a time of preparation and teaching that he was again saying to them that as the Son of Man, he would be betrayed and killed and rise again, whatever the heck that meant. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. They were afraid to ask him? Well, of course they were. He's talking about sacrifice and death. Perhaps they were thinking, Ooh, maybe if I say nothing, he'll, maybe it'll all go away. He'll, for, he'll forget he even brought it up. It's really tempting to be hypercritical of the dim-witted disciples. Because, let's face it, they are often pretty dim-witted. It can seem easy from our perspective to say, hey guys, wake up. How many times does he have to say it to your face? But we really got to cut him some slack. I mean, their understanding of the Messiah, the Son of Man, was hardwired. For hundreds of years, their culture defined the Messiah as an earthly king, a successor to David. Death? Vulnerability? Failure? Jesus can't be serious. How do any of those things go with the concept of a Messiah? Perhaps he means something else. After all, he's always talking in parables, right? And even if Jesus does die, that means one of them will have to pick up the pieces and take on his leadership. So the disciples argue among themselves who is the greatest. And when Jesus asks them what they've been arguing about, silence, again. Of course, Jesus knows the answer. Right? So Jesus sits and he teaches them and us. And as Jesus is wont to do, he turns everything upside down to expose God's truths. He reverses what he knows to be their expectations. But whoever of you wants to be first must be last and servant of all. And then he places a child among them. Now, for us, children are symbol of hope. And, and what's more, they're so darn cute. Eh? They're full of potential and promise. But that's not how it was in Jesus' day. According to biblical scholars and social anthropologists Bruce Molina and Richard Rohrbach, childhood in antiquity was a time of terror. 
That's crucial for us to keep in mind. In the world in which Jesus lived, wealth and power were signs of God's blessing. But children, they had no wealth, they had no power. They were almost non-entities, at least until people were assured that they would survive childhood. They had no, I'm sure they, they were loved and valued within their own families, but they had no status. They were family property. To society, children were no more important than slaves, probably even less so, because they couldn't work as hard. Mortality rates among children were high. Fewer than half survived until age 16. They were, and still are, the first to suffer from famine and war and disease. Just consider the children in Gaza and Darfur today. Along with widows, they were symbols of the bottom of the social order. Focusing or, or counting on them got you nowhere in the world. And we have a different relationship to children in the West today, probably because our, our birth and mortality rates are so much lower. Today, if you wanted to create a media firestorm, you would show children in peril. Haven't the deaths of the children in Gaza been the imagery that has instilled the greatest outrage around the world? Haven't the deaths of school children from gun violence also been the primary source of outrage in our own country? If we were to contemporize Jesus' imagery in this text to approximate the same effect for our society, perhaps we might hear Jesus say, Whoever welcomes a poor black sub-Saharan African orphan from Darfur welcomes me and the one who sent me. Or whoever welcomes an undereducated inner city transgender youth with a history of petty crime welcomes me and the one who sent me. And instead of fear-mongering and demonizing Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, who are here legally and helping contribute to the revitalization of that small Ohio town, perhaps some of our politicians and media outlets should consider an outreach campaign that actually quotes the spirit of Jesus. Whoever welcomes the six-year-old Haitian refugee and her family welcomes me and the one who sent me. And rather than focusing on our upward social and economic mobility, which we assume assures our salvation, our security, our status, Jesus invites us to consider death, the death of our own self-importance, of our assumptions about who and what matters. Jesus invites us to come downstairs and not only welcome, but play with and serve the children and the others who share their lowly status. Because serve them and you serve Christ. Serve them and you transform the world. That's how we find our connection to God. And that's how we discover our Christ nature. We put the vulnerable first. If the people in our own country really want to imagine they are God-fearing followers of Christ, we need to start serving and protecting the children fleeing across our borders from the violence of their home countries, whether that be Haiti or Venezuela or Central America or the Middle East. But instead, many demonize them and scapegoat them for their own perceived losses and shortcomings. After all, it, it is no denying the fact that for most Latin American refugees making their way to our borders, it's our population's demand for illegal drugs and our gun manufacturers' willingness to flood their markets with weaponry that has plummeted their societies into chaos. We're not innocent bystanders. 
We contribute to that horror. It's also our agricultural policies, you know, with corn subsidies and the like that have decimated their local markets for their own agricultural goods and forced many to abandon their farms and their hometowns and look for work in El Norte. Who wants to naturally abandon their home to go to a strange land if it's not for desperation? Do we not owe their children the attention and the care and the welcome that Jesus commands? Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. So we're left to consider what child of God we are each called to welcome, no matter what their age. How might that look for us over the coming years? And welcome means more than be nice to. It actually means entering into relationship with. Welcome, it means that we are sharing our resources, our time, our talent, our treasure, our very selves with them. And I'm, I'm very proud and, and impressed to say that so many of you already live that welcome. Some seek out the face of the stranger here on a Sunday morning and you introduce yourselves to them and then them to others. Some of you cook and eat and pray with new people as, as they walk through these doors for, the of this, for various community events and musical offerings. And some of you do it by supporting the needy children and families of our great wider neighborhood through Foothill Unity Center. Some of you pay special attention to the children and youth of this parish on Sunday mornings with our intergenerational ministry. And others work with other local service organizations. Some of you have even started your own special outreach ministries. When we hear at St. Luke's state that we are, quote, healing the world one welcome at a time, we are asserting that it is by building relationships of care that we live out our Christian callings and experience Christ in our midst. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in our midst. And he's right next to us in the pews. That's a place to start. That's not a place to finish. Our time together within these walls and with these friends and neighbors is always preparation for our work out in the world. That's why we finish every service with uh, um, uh, Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <clears throat> my voice, sorry, and my mind. We, that's the culmination of our baptismal covenant. We serve Christ in all people. Seek and serve Christ in all people and respect the dignity of every human being, not just our peers. We're called to give place and attention to the least of these among us. In the, and in the words of St. James, to, quote, show by our good lives that our works are done with gentleness and born of wisdom. Oh, Lord, give us that wisdom. Draw near to God, to the vulnerable ones in your midst, and he will draw near to you. Thanks be to God. Amen.